Thank you all for tuning in. The following is a presentation of Bald Spots Productions. Be sure to like, comment, and share. You know, subscribe, follow, whatever it is you've got to do to kick that algorithm into gear and help us reach more people. Yes, it is I, your humble host, Bill Hatch the Third, coming to you live from the Palatial Home Studios of Bald Spots Productions here in the beautiful city of Malden, Missouri. Joining me from more than acceptable safe social distances are my guests for today. We have Naresh Visa. How are you doing, Naresh? Doing all right. And Looking Michael Maynard. Discussion. How are you doing, Michael? Doing well. Thank you for having me on. Hey, the pleasure's all mine. And uh, um, yeah, we've got, uh, uh, let's see, Naresh Visa is the CEO and founder of Krish Media and Marketing. And Michael is the founder and CEO of Oh Nutrition, and uh, um, and Oh Mino, as it says on his shirt, <laughs> is the uh, is the brand. So uh, um, so yeah, so uh, um, I always uh, ask the same question of my uh, of my guests when we get started uh, because I find it interesting. Who are you reading? So uh, we'll start with you, Michael. Who are you reading right now? I'm reading Peter Atia, and he Peter has an Atiyah. incredible book. He's a podcaster, Peter, Dr. Peter Atia, and he okay. has a book called Outlive. And it's not just outlive, it's literally how to live better than others, and it's more health span than life uh, longevity. So that's who I'm reading okay. right now. Okay, yeah, that quality of life is definitely uh, oh so important. And uh, people often uh, forget about that. What's uh, what's a key takeaway from uh, from that one for you so far? It's not how long you live. Um, most people have what they call the marginalized decade because they are living good okay. and then they slow down, slow down. Then that last 10 years, he has a different curve. He'd rather you live, 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 live and live long. Do stuff in your 80s and then die, you know. Instead of do do, right. do 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 the long death, and he has a right, concept of Centurion decline. Olympics. So, okay. if you want to live to a hundred, even if you don't, and you only make it, well, what should you be doing now in the long term, in training, you know, as a forty-year-old, a fifty-year-old, or six-year-old, to take you into those long ages, so you have that quality of life. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I have a an aunt who, uh, um, you know, tragically uh, passed away, but. She had her quality of life right up to the day she died, and then the next morning, my Sweet. my uncle found her uh, uh, that she had passed away, and uh, um, no no real reason for it, just boom. And so she had that quality of life. And then I have other uh, friends who uh, who get that slow decline, and it's like I I don't know if I really want that. It doesn't look that attractive. No one does. No. So uh yeah the uh the decline not so much the uh um the uh the sudden stop at the end uh, that 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 sounds all right. <laughs> How about you Naresh what are you reading? I'm reading two books if I was in my bedroom right on my bedstand uh these are older books nothing new I'm not sure about the Atia books but the two books one is a book called Raising a Tiger by Earl Woods, who was Tiger Woods' father. Mm -hmm. And the big takeaway, I have two very young sons. Uh, the, the big takeaway that, uh, I'm still in the middle of the book, but the big takeaway is that when children are very young, that's when you want to be the most active parent. That's when you want to put in all the work. Parents think, oh, I'll wait until my kids are five years old or six years old or seven years old, and then I'll put them in golf and Earl Wood's case or tennis or music or sports or whatever, mm -hmm. teach them math or reading. But Earl Wood says, no, you want to start them as young as possible. And he started training Tiger Woods in golf when Tiger was six or seven months old. Now that's, yeah, that's, that's, uh, how do you train a six or seven month old? It's not like he was getting Tiger to hold clubs and play golf. He, he would just go to the driving range and hit balls himself, Earl Woods would, and Tiger would just watch. Mm -hmm. 
And then by the time Tiger was two, he was old enough to pick up a club and try it himself. So um, a lot of good lessons there. And the other book that I'm reading is called Nation of Victims by Vivek Ramaswamy, former presidential candidate. Uh, Very fascinating book with great anecdotes uh, from history and statistics and data about how uh, we all have the potential as Americans in this country for success. Uh, all we have to do is find purpose and meaning in our lives, find what we're good at, and we can succeed regardless of our race or name or how long our name is or skin color or religion or sexuality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um now to to go back to uh, um, to Earl uh, Woods, um, you know, it seems to me that a lot of habits um, are formed. The foundations for them are formed when uh, when we're really young. So that makes a lot of sense. That uh, um, you know, when uh, when the kids are really young, you uh, would create those habits for eating right and um, and proper exercise and. And also the intellectual pursuits, so uh, you know, math, science, um, reading, uh, philosophy, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, the foundations, uh, I would think, would be much easier to uh, to lay when uh, when the child is very young. Um, I know uh, my parents uh, read to me, and I was an early reader, and uh, um, and things just kind of took off from there for me. Um, you know, so uh, so yeah, that makes uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and uh um yeah and, well, uh, when i, I, when I, when I think about my own hmm. when i think about my own life uh my parents compared to earl wood started way later part of it was financial part of it was they were immigrants mm-hmm. just there wasn't google there was you know if if, if you're a three-year-old and you want to play <laughs> baseball you didn't know where to go you didn't know where the field was today at our fingertips you just type in you know your zip code and anything and you'll you'll find it it's, it's right yeah. there at your fingertips and so Oh yeah, um, I agree. So other older parents are like, aren't your kids tired? Don't they get tired from, you know, such a young age doing this stuff? And my kids don't know what being tired means. They don't get tired because yeah. they started so young. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's yeah. also what's going to keep you young. Rush, you're you're going to stay young because you have younger kids. I didn't even meet my wife until I was 30. So I had all these college buddies and high school buddies that by the time I had kids, their kids were like in high school. And then we would get together on these reunions, these get togethers, and they'd say, wow, you look so good. What, what is your secret? I go, well, you're sitting watching TV and maybe helping your kid with homework. I'm giving them pony rides on the ground. Yeah. I'm lifting them up and throwing them <laughs> as high as I can. I, I, don't rec- I don't do that now, but at the time, you know, let's throw the kids <laughs> around, spin them around. Let's, I was doing pony rides. And I like to say up until last week, but both my daughters this month turned 22 and 24. But still, I envy the times that you're in right now, Naresh. Uh, those, those are the best years. When you come home from work, I felt like I was the Beatles. Uh, my daughters would go, Daddy, Daddy's home and shaking because they're with their mom all day, who's wonderful. But I was the icing on her cake. So. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you think about all the all the little things that we n- learn naturally from our parents. Um, you know, I mean, those are the years when we when we learn language um, and uh, and mimic whatever it is our parents are doing. So, you know, when we see dad giving us pony rides, then that's normal. And uh, um, and and that's what we learn to expect out of uh, out of life. Um you know, so uh, um, so definitely uh, a good it, it, uh, a good set of. Uh... Well, I'll, I'll say one thing about both the books: the one commonality they have, because Earl Woods talks about this uh, throughout his book, especially in the introduction, and that is once again, hard work, dedication, determination. Uh, that's what mm-hmm. gets you to the top. And and Earl Woods could have made every excuse possible for himself for his son regarding race or or anything else but he says hey i started my boy at six seven months of age and he worked hard and he rose to the top and you can too your 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 children can too and of course the the vikramaswamy's book is is all about that general concept and idea 
Yeah. That's awesome. Um, um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking I about recommend picking up a uh, – oh, go ahead. I was just ready to say that whole hard work. Um, I believe every family, in their own words, needs to have a little mantra. And the mantra is, if I start a sentence, my kids finish the sentence, or even my wife, whoever starts it, the rest of the family. And I don't know where I got this. Maybe it was from a, a former coach in life. But if, when I say, hmm. hey, guys, hard work, and then they instantly answer, pays off. So I encourage wow. every family to figure out what their mantra is based on their goals, based on their aspirations. But uh, again, hard work pays off. So that's been drilled into to at least my girls at a very young age. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I've been thinking about picking up uh, Ramaswamy's uh, book. Um, I do like quite a bit of what uh, what he said, and I've, I've heard some bits and pieces of the book. But uh, um, but yeah, um, you know, we live in a country where uh, where success is well, uh, is an opportunity for everyone. Oh yeah, yeah. I've only yeah, heard he about has, uh, Nation has, of Victims. Three of them. Well, his his famous one is called Woke Inc. That's the one that that was a number one New York Times bestseller. Uh, okay. His other two books, so Woke Inc. and and Capitalist Punishment, are more like finance oriented. Uh, Nation mm -hmm. of Victims is is for everybody. It's and, and anybody can read it, but the other two, you have to know a little bit of finance and business, which I do. That's what my background is. Yeah. But um, we've got three of them out there. Yeah, yeah. My background's in uh, in business as well. Um, so, which makes today's show uh, an interesting possibility. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, um, so yeah. So, uh, Naresh, how did you uh, come to start? Uh, 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 Chris Media and Marketing. Well, it's it, there's a short answer and there's a long answer. I started it in 2013 from the apartment I was living in downtown Baltimore. The long answer is I spent years up until that point gaining experience in the media and marketing spaces. Uh, and also in the financial spaces. So I worked on Wall Street for a little bit and then uh, was a financial analyst and equities analyst, then ended up working in financial media and marketing in Baltimore for probably the largest financial marketing company in the world. And just my overall experiences uh, led me to start a side hustle while I was working full time. And then that side hustle ended up becoming Chris Media and Marketing in 2013, what was supposed to be, not supposed to be, it, it was a trial run, a two-year trial run has now turned into 12 years. So I'm going, uh, entering my 12th year, being in business completely for myself. And thanks to Chris Media and Marketing, I've been able to start a second business called Chris Capital, which is a real estate investing and consulting firm. So, oh, wow. That's the long gist of it. It, it was a it was a process <laughs> and a journey. That's uh, that's cool. Yeah, I had a a guest on uh, the other week uh, um, who uh, um, uh, as uh, called himself the anti financial uh, uh, advisor, and uh, um, his uh, his big thing was uh, um, was uh, real estate. That uh, that that seems to be where uh, where real uh, uh, real wealth is uh, is made in this country. And uh, and of course, as we see, we've seen can also be taken away in this country. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> not to not to get too much into politics, uh, although we could Never. if, uh, if well, we wanted to. That before. Well, generally, generally, real estate cannot be. It's hard for it to be taken away from you. So we're in uncharted yeah. territory. Uh, I was yeah. not. It's not just in this country. In most countries, real estate owners, that's, that's wealth, that's generational wealth, owning property, commercial property, residential property, multifamily mm -hmm. complexes. That's, that's how you build wealth. I didn't know much about real estate, despite my background in finance, until through Chris Media and Marketing, doing the back end web work and, and marketing work for a client. That's how I discovered real estate investing. And as I started to meet people who didn't have the degrees that I had, who didn't have the formal education that I had, 
Mm -hmm. who were worth millions of dollars. And they said, oh, real estate. I got started when I was 18 years old, 19 years old, uh, 2009, wow. 2010. That's when I entered. Then I said, huh, like, I think I should start looking into this a little bit more. And I bought my first property in 2017. Um, and I've, I've bought uh, Scaled Up since then, uh, all pre-2021. So inflation real estate is an amazing inflation hedge we we've, we've obviously seen a, a lot of inflation and i'm very pro real estate and i look forward to continuing to grow my portfolio and like i said i also consult as well so i coach people help people like me who might have on paper all these degrees and formal training and corporate experience and they're like whoa what, what, where am i going wrong here like i'm still stuck in this rat race like and so i help them with real estate investing as well where do you, uh, um, where's your uh, portfolio uh, folk concentrated in? Most people have Southeast a, a niche. United States. So, Southeast United States. Okay, yeah, so, so down here. Southeast United States. So it's Florida, Tennessee, Mississippi. Uh, yes, Florida, Tennessee, and Mississippi. So uh, that's good to know. Um, Okay, uh, Michael, let's uh, let's come over to you here for uh, for a moment and uh, um, and talk about uh, O nutrition and O Mino. Um, how'd you uh, how'd you get started in the nutrition game? I too have a long story. Uh, I wish I could, had a shorter story, but uh, I originally started my career in advertising and marketing, and I noticed my clients who are the marketing side versus the advertise had much better quality of life. You know, because they were paying the money and they just seemed to go home on time and we never did. So I decided I wanted to go client side. And the first company I went for went to in 1993 when I started in supplements was a little fringe health food company called Alicer. Uh, they were struggling. I helped uh, kind of rebuild them a little bit. Took them from like a six million dollar company to in the 20s. Uh, expanded a line. If you haven't heard of Alicer. I'm one of the guys behind the emergency brand. You can see it everywhere oh, now, okay. now that it's owned by Pfizer or Glaxo. It's changed hands a few times. But when you take a company from relative obscurity up to mass market, you get you get noticed. And then I got headhunted by literally the largest supplement manufacturer in the world. And by the way, if you're the largest in America, you usually are the largest in the world. It's not just Pippi <laughs> language. And I just climbed up that corporate ladder as a product manager to a different division manager to marketing group manager, director, senior director, you know. And at one time, um, I was in charge of all new products uh, and product development for this manufacturer on the vitamin side. It was like a 200 million plus um, operating unit each year. Uh, and then eventually, all companies have an issue our drug side had problem with the FDA and that hmm. operating unit pretty much brought down the whole company. And we were about wow. an $809 million company and we'll get into all the details, but at a certain point when it's finally over, uh, and I got compensated really well. I, I got a different package than most, but your friends encourage you going, well, did you ever discover, you know, how much you actually made for that company? And I said, yeah, ironically, I did. Because when these things go bad and you're in bankruptcy and this and that, you've got a little extra time on your hands. Not a lot, but enough to, <laughs> I got all the data here and start looking at it. And I actually made that company over $2 billion. Wow. $2 billion that had my thumbprint all over it. So I did not put out my resume. This is 2008. I decided to start the company under a different name at that time. And if you remember, 2008 was one of the worst times to start a company, if everyone remembers oh, what yeah. happened in 2008. It also made me bitter because the same banks that needed bailout didn't bail us out, and it was a good company. So I was not heartbroken when the banks had to go exactly through what I had to go through you know, four months, six months earlier. But within my company, it originally started business to business, uh, a contract manufacturing organization and development organization for other people. And at the time when I started it, I said to myself, you know what? I'm going to be kicking myself in the head for the rest of my life. I'm in my mid-40s that I didn't start Bless my own you. company. 
so yeah, God bless. So then all of a sudden, 2017, 18 comes in, my company's doing well. And then I had the same language. If I don't develop my own brand to the consumer, I'm going to be kicking mm -hmm. myself in the head for the rest of my life. And in what I do, I get to see successful patents, unsuccessful patents from a financial standpoint. And many times those unsuccessful patents have great science. So I was mm -hmm. able to go out uh, and create a brand called Omino, which is patented essential amino acids for muscle synthesis. The science was stronger than anything I'd seen in my 30 years. Uh, the patent was underutilized. So I negotiated terms to carve out my own little space of how to deal with these patent, now patents. And I developed a consumer brand uh, and officially launched in 2019. And it's still a niche brand. It's not huge, but it's a multi-million dollar brand. Um, I, uh, you know, retain marketing people, advertising people, different agencies that help run a direct to consumer brand, which at first sounds, oh, how hard can it be? You know, I used to think that because some of my clients were direct to consumer and I, I didn't think they were sharp, but little did I know, oh, they were sharp. They might not have known supplements like me, but they knew direct marketing and all the acronyms that go with it and all of the KPIs and this and that. So. Um, branding is more fun than selling commodity soft gels and doses, you know, for my business to business clients, but that I know was way too long and I apologize, but that's how I came about starting my company in 2000. Where can, uh, where can people find, uh, Omino if it's a, if it's a niche brand? Uh, I, I had this right on the side in case, just in case this is my brand Omino. Uh, the best play, unfortunately, I thought I was so smart and, uh, Naresh is going to laugh at me at this. I wanted, O oh, and then the explanation point, because originally I was going to come out with Omega three, which I have a huge background in. So then what's the company behind it? O oh, nutrition. Oh, this, but guess what? You can't use on a website or a URL, an what they call a wild point. card or a wild character. Yeah. So it's O H M I N O dot com. <laughs> And you'll see my full email. line of, <laughs> of sports nutrition. Everything's around uh, essential amino acids and amino acids in general. So every time I see a new product, I have to figure out, you know, how can we, uh, is there for that particular benefit on the patent, is there science that saying amino also have, shares the same benefit or can be a catalyst to that benefit or is there a synergistic? So it's a limited line of only nine products. I started off with three and from 18 or I'm sorry, 2019 to 2024, going from three to eight really isn't a huge pipeline. But if anything, I now have an audience of athletes. And so I've been looking into supplements for athletes. Athletes still have nutritional needs. I've got a nice 35, 38,000 customers who buy from me. So I now have a, a pipeline to when I find the right science uh, and new brand extension and names in case it doesn't fit in the amino acid uh, space. So I am going to bring back that Omega and it's going to be Omega-3 for athletes. So that's probably going to hit <laughs> late this year. Yeah, that uh, that Omega-3 is uh, is also important, uh, I've uh, I found out and and uh, and apparently not the easiest one to get. But, uh, um, but yeah, because uh, you have to like eat a real amount uh, of fish, or you can buy the supplements. Yeah, yeah, it seems like everybody's supplements uh, are strong on the omega six and nine, but not so much on the threes. Uh, um, That's the curse of the American important... diet. Yep, yep, for sure. How important is the uh, the website um, to uh, to you? Um, you know, having it match with the branding. Um, has it, uh, has, do you think it's hurt your, hurt, uh, um, hurt your, uh, your internet, uh, uh, process, your internet sales, your internet, uh, um, thing, not having that exclamation point in there or, uh, or is that something that's well, just, that's just the, yeah, that's no big deal. That's just the URL people type in. If you go to Google and type mm -hmm. in the name with the exclamation point, it will then show my name with the exclamation point. I've got a Google team, so it will show pictures. 
You can even do Google Shop okay. right then and there, or better yet, go to our site. Uh, we have the pop-ups for discount codes. So it was just more of a awkwardness for me. I am a perfectionist, <laughs> and that was one of those things that I'm not an IT guy. Um, I'm a creative guy. I'm a science guy when it comes to nutrition, but not when it comes to, to digits and when it comes mm -hmm. to you know URLs and API keys and all that. So luckily, you, you can find good people and, and bring them yeah. to take care of your, your weaknesses so I can concentrate on my strengths. Okay. That's, uh, that's definitely a good, uh, a good way to look at it. Uh, so Naresh, um, uh, what about you? Uh, um, where, uh, where can we find you online? How can we find, uh, how can we find, uh, Chris media and, uh, and your capital, uh, Chris capital. Yeah. Well, Chris media and marketing, like I said, is a full service online and digital media and marketing agency. The website is chrishmediamarketing.com. That's K-R-I-S-H mediamarketing.com. And you can see all the services that we have to offer there. And if you're interested on the real estate investing side, you can just contact me through there as well. It's free coaching that I offer. Uh, so I mm. am happy to help folks you might be wondering, well, if it's free, there's got to be some type of catch or something. Well, remember that uh, to invest in real estate, you have to buy property. So um, right. I don't represent buyers as agents or anything, but mm -hmm. I do have relationships with builders, wholesalers, et cetera, all around the country, mm -hmm. especially the Southeast United States where I invest in. So uh, I'm paid marketing fees to help promote their properties and I only promote what I think are properties that I would buy myself or what I think just make a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so the, the network uh, makes the net worth. Then uh... exactly what it is. I, I, I wouldn't have gotten where I am today without the network. That's for sure. Yeah. What's uh, yeah. How important is, uh, is a good network um, to, uh, to your business? Um, I, uh, I myself belong to a, uh, to a networking group. Um, it's a, it's a small, newer, uh, newer one, but, uh, I like it and, uh, um, and all, but, uh, but how important has the network been to, well, as, as I said, the, uh, the little cliche, the network, uh, is, makes the net worth, um, how important has, uh, has networking, uh, been to, uh, to your businesses? And, uh, I, this is either, either one of you. Don't everybody okay, answer. Go. Once. Yeah, go um... ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> So for me, on my business-to-business -business side, I was able to approach companies I knew uh, based on where I came corporately. Uh, I did not have to sign a non-compete. I had been undone enough plant tours to know which ones I should work with as vendors. And the customers, to me, that, that part, I don't want to say it's easy, but I also had a network of people who introduced me to my first customers. Some of them, actually, I already knew anyway. But people will say, well, how can a network help you with your, um, with your direct-to-consumer brand? And here's just a, another little prop that I brought. I now have a fat burner. I always wanted to do a fat burner, but the science never really helped me. So I'm talking to a colleague and saying, yeah, one of these days I can't wait to do a fat burner. That's the perfect add-on that brings in people who aren't in the fitness culture, widens the opportunity. And he goes, well, why aren't you talking to my friend? I'm just going to use a fake name, Gus. He's working with a patented uh, ingredient out of Europe. And that's always for me. I will only do something that has real science, real efficacious, mm -hmm. and backed by a patent. So if anyone copies me, I just tell them, and they send the nasty grams and get their attorneys involved. But with that, I said, you know, prove it to me. He sent me some samples. And I lost a ton of weight, too much weight. And I wasn't big wow. to begin with. I just wanted to see, I, you know, I was always a bigger guy. You could see I'm a little skinny in the shirt right now. Um, <laughs> but with that, I wouldn't have this new product that I'm about to drop uh, in the next two weeks if it wasn't me talking to a friend in my industry, maintaining that relationship. It's real easy when you happen to like the people. Um and then he happened to like me and said, oh, you need to talk with my friend Gus. And so that conversation started in August. 
and here we are uh, late March into April. I wish I would have met him earlier so I could have dropped it New Year's resolution. But you know what? I've got creative marketing people. We'll figure out how to drop it in what I call swimsuit season, uh, which is sure. right around the corner with Memorial Day. So, so yeah. they, they do go a long way. Um, they do, and you just have to be smart enough because if you quote unquote work your network and you're always handing business cards, you, you might come off like the politician kissing babies. So mm. my biggest advice to everybody is you just got to be yourself. And if you're uncomfortable shaking people's hands, that person that you do know, you just let them know, by the way, I'm not comfortable just introducing. So he literally walks you up to people and say, have you met Michael? Easiest intro in the world. And they go, no, I haven't. And then you talk. So I'm not the guy who goes up to strangers or even at a mixer is good at it. And again, know your strengths, know your weaknesses. But the other thing is, is the biggest strength for anyone is be who you are, be real. And if you like the people in your network, those are the ones you want to spend more time, not because you're trying to get something out of them, but because life's too short not to have real meaningful relationships. Okay, so it's about the relationship, not uh, not about uh, not about passing out the uh, the old business card. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, the uh, yeah, I hate cold calling, and uh, and I actually don't really care much for networking events because so much of them uh, seem to be uh, um, like speed dating, and it's like, what's the point? You know, you're not really getting to know anybody, and uh, um, yeah, because it's there. There's so many people to meet, and it's just yeah, it's ridiculous. Now, are <laughs> any of you in like a trusted advisor mastermind type of group? Which is a little different because now it's the same right. people you meet regularly. Are any of you involved in something like that? Um, yeah, for me, I'm in a group called CBMC which is the Christian Businessmen's Connection. They have different products depending on, and what I call products just because I'm a product guy. Um, the One of those divisions that I'm a part of, and they're all localized throughout the country, is called Trusted Advisors. And in this group, they get together other CEOs, founders, owners of businesses. Uh, I'm in a chapter that meets in my local uh, city, Seal Beach, California. It's the same people. We always welcome more. We l would love to see it grow, but we also don't want to see it become 30 people. We think like 12 people, 12, 15 mm -hmm. people max. And we're all in different industries. So it's not necessarily about networking. But as CEOs, we still all have the same challenge. We still have payroll. We still have accounts receivable. We still have motivation of staff. So... I'm the only person who sells a real product. It's, uh, you know, we have some attorneys, we have some financial people, we've got mortgage people, we've got insurance people, we got, of all things, a uh, basketball academy of how he trains, you know, kids, you know, from a young age to get to the better high schools to then get D1 scholarships. Um, maybe a guy who owns a warehouse and fulfillment company. But again, even though I can't tell him Anything that he doesn't know about LTL trucking, full of, I mean, that, that's embarrassing that I would even bring it up to a guy who owns that. But I can tell him how I managed uh, and how I started clearing out the weeds to, you know, when your sales are great, hooray, but when they start going down, it's like, ooh, all the infrastructure I built for that size company, I'm now this size company, but still that discipline, here's how I approach the problem and then how they approach problems. So there is networking that can help grow your business, but I'm a strong advocate of finding a mastermind group or whatever you call it. And this one here is easy for me because I, I lean into my faith. I don't avoid it um, just because, again, that's who I am. And finding like Christian businessmen leaders, especially the ones who own the company. We have a couple who don't own the company, but they're huge companies and they're CEOs. So getting into that kind of uh, group, regardless of it, it could be an alumni group and you all have in common the school you went to. It can all, it can be, you know, regionalized. Um, and again, the commonality is we're Christians and we're business owners. 
and high, we're at a high level where we can make an influence. So I highly recommend those type of groups uh, to help and truly be what it's meant to be, advisors. Okay. And I completely agree. Um, when you have the same rooted ethos, ethos it, it says a lot. And I carry it one step further. I will sell my product to anybody, even my business to business. I'm successful enough now that I don't have to say yes at every opportunity. And if I find that the guy is prickly, that's a nice way of saying it. Other people would use profanity, uh, but prickly or salty. And I know he's going to just be a pain. I let him know, you know, I think he'd be serviced better elsewhere. So, but regardless of their background, their religion, I'm here to serve. Now, when it comes to partnerships, um, in my Bible, as a Christian, it talks about partnerships. And I think a lot of people think it's just, oh, you marry someone in your faith. Well, when you see what marriage is, a legal document, so is a business partner. So I've had opportunities that I had to decline because I'm honest saying, you know, um, if I'm signing my paper, I need, we need to get to know each other at a spiritual level and I need to know your faith. Because uh, my Bible, the way I interpret it, is any partnership, whether it's marriage or a business partnership, we need to be equally yoked and we need to be of the same faith. Um, and again, that's kind of where I draw my line is when it's a true business partner, because that is a legal arrangement, just like a marriage is. And I take that part seriously. And I've had to say no to certain people who've come to me. And I've had to say no to people as I did my due diligence of looking partners for other initiatives. I work with. So that's pretty hardcore. Great. Yeah. By the way, the... you are a definition of success. When you could say no to financial opportunities. And when you can match your own ethos and know every night before you go to bed that you are honoring God. And to me, a lot, you know, I think hard work pays off. You guys were supposed to say that. But I do believe oh, that hard work <laughs> in itself, that's all right. Hard work in itself is a form of worship. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the uh, the Christian Bible teaches it similarly. Um, the... Uh, um, the, the the unethical man uh, gets called to uh, to heaven. God says, "You fool! Tonight your uh, your soul will be called accounting, you know, called called into account." Um, and uh, yeah, um, you know, we know uh, we know in real life that uh, um, that unethical companies fall. Uh, MCI, Enron, to use historically big uh, big falls. Um, you know, the the kind that they teach you in business school. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, um, so yeah, so eventually the bad ethics do catch up to you. Um, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, maybe, uh, maybe it takes 20 years, but, uh, but eventually you're going to be called to account for, uh, for what you've done. I, I love how you started with scripture. At first, I thought you were saying that when you're bad and you get to heaven, they put you in the accounting department. <laughs> no, no, they make you sit by the uh, in the room by the ice maker. There you go. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, it's uh, definitely. Sorry, the the there's an echo somewhere, and it's and it's bothering me. <laughs> but uh, um, but yeah, I, I, um, I've been there. Yeah, um, but yeah, being hey, able gone. to say uh, to say no to something that is unethical is definitely. Um, you know, a, a great definition of success. Life's too short. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I definitely, uh, definitely like that. We're back to, uh, to kind of where we started, where, uh, um, where what's instilled within you as a young, you know, when you're young, um, definitely stays with you when you're older, um, raise a child in the way that he uh, should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. Um, to go uh, to go OT um, on you, um, but uh, um, yeah, um, yeah, we're back to uh, um, to uh, show your kid what it's like to uh, to play golf when he's six months old, you know, and uh, and instilling those habits when uh, when they're child when they're children. Um, it's possible to get out of uh, to get out of your uh, your your unethical behavior when you're older, but it's uh, it's definitely not easy. Um, 
you know, uh, the, the old saying that it takes, uh, it takes three weeks to build a new habit. Well, that's not exactly true. Uh, it can be a lot harder than that. Uh, my, uh, my cousin is currently trying to quit smoking and, uh, and it's like, he took 40 some odd years to, uh, to get where he was. And, uh, and now everybody expects him to just drop it. And, uh, um, you know, he, he's trying, but it's, uh, it's definitely not, uh, not easy to, uh, to do. So, uh, um, you know, so make sure those, uh, make sure those, those kiddos, uh, don't pick up any bad habits along the way. And I, I hear that's a nasty habit to quit they yeah. say tobacco cigarettes is harder than heroin harder than alcohol so i, I feel for that I, I never had such a habit i've always been an athlete and that's the one thing i was always able to shy away from is inhaling anything that's nasty so yeah yeah and again oh. i think like you said um Naresh is my kids got me into athletics at a younger age you know teaching discipline teamwork um submission to the coach you know, do what he says because he knows more than you. Respect for authority. You know, that, that and the Boy Scouts. You know, yeah, yeah. People have a misconception well, uh, that alcohol helps with sleep, and it only there's multiple aspects of restorative sleep, and one is mm -hmm. called latency, which basically means how long does it take you to get asleep? And alcohol actually works very well on that, but. What people don't understand is you just drank, you're now in bed. Your body's actually now going to process that. And when you get down to what is alcohol, this make this helps people stop or at least limit. Your your body and your liver and different organs have to process ethanol because that's what alcohol is. So for me, I found myself drinking too much and I started uh, reducing my intake. And then I came up with my rules of engagement. Because uh, I don't think alcohol is bad. It can lead to bad behavior. It could lead to alcoholism um, for those who, unfortunately, might be genetically inclined to that. But for me, rule number one is if it tastes good with the meal. Drinking wine on its own is okay, but when you actually have it paired with the right meal, the right red with the steak, the right red with lasagna. So my rule number one is why am I drinking? Is there tasty food? Well, no, there's not. Okay, so don't drink. The next is, is it social? Meaning, am I gathering with some friends and we're going to have a drink? It's like, okay, I can drink. So it has to be good with food, has to be social. And the other thing is it has to be delicious. And that's more, again, on the wine side. If I don't mm -hmm. like the wine, I'm not going to finish it just because it's alcohol. You know, if it tastes bad, I'm just spit it out and set it to the side, not to be rude. Um, and then the other thing is I do limit to a certain amount of drinks per week that keeps me safe, honest. And again, your body, how it processes ethanol actually interferes with sleep, interferes with restorative sleep, deep cycle and REM. So everyone who who's listening to this think, hey, I need alcohol to go to bed. Uh, like Naresh, uh, you you will figure out a way to fall asleep without it. Maybe it will take you longer to fall asleep. But the overall sleep experience is enhanced when you are not drinking. Yeah, um, yeah, and then mm -hmm. well, yeah, having having those kinds of rules works for uh, for most things that we do uh, in our lives. Um, Michael and I uh, talked a little bit, very briefly, about sugar earlier. Um, I think that was before uh, before we started recording the show, and uh, that's another one of those things uh, that uh, you know, it's like uh, for for me, it's food is the uh is the big downfall i love food i love eating um and uh um you know it's like i'll, I'll have a little bit to drink and uh and all and i've had the occasional cigar but uh um but nothing uh nothing other than food that uh that one might say i was addicted to and uh um you know uh i i'm having to develop those uh those kinds of rules for uh for that does it taste good um is it uh is it social um you know, and uh, um, does it uh, does it? But does it advance my life? I think is uh, is the big question. Does it uh, does it take me where I want to go? And uh, um, certainly, I want to go to an ethical place. I want to uh, to go to a healthy place, and uh, um, you know, I want to go to a prosperous place. <laughs> but uh, um, 
you know, so uh, so definitely uh, um, can uh, um, can see uh, how that would uh, work well for just about any area of one's life, which I guess is the definition of ethics. My question to you, Bill. Um, mm -hmm. My question to you, Bill, is: Let's say you knew that sugar was poison. By the way, I think sugar is poison. But let's say there's this delicious powder out there and it tastes so good, but you know it's poison. Would you still eat the poison? And sugar has created a, at least in America, uh, the term I call, I kind of mash up um, diabetes uh, with obesity. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. so it's, you know, I, you put the two, I think it was called Dibosity. I, I I can't remember which one. I, a while back, I, I, I said the word, and someone goes, "Oh wow, that's really." I think I just messed up talking at the time, but still, the sugar and people add the sugars. If you're going to do sugar, find the ones in strawberries and fruit that also has yeah. the fiber there as well. You then delay, um, you know, how uh, sugar spikes and doesn't spike. Uh, if you do do sugar, do sugar at the end of the meal, which. Some and I guess I guess that's where dessert kind of works because now that you got fats and carbs and different things in your body, then you add something that might hopefully be a natural form of sugar. Uh, it's going to slow it down so your glycemic index doesn't go through the roof. But right. um, I think I read in a book somewhere about the things that people love or have kind of started to accept, and one was sugar. And a person put a pile of sugar out in the woods. How long will it take for these animals to eat it? An animal didn't mm -hmm. eat it. So then he takes margarine right. the next day and puts a big block of margarine. Nobody ate it. He put out butter? Oh, yeah, people ate the butter. People love fat. <laughs> you know, or not people, right. animals. But just animals. the fact that an animal is smarter than us when it comes to trans fats and inf inflammatory oil fats that are found in margarine. Uh, mm -hmm. And as well as sugar. So I am also a diabetic, and it did not happen mm -hmm. because I got big and fat. I've never been obese. I've carried a few extra pounds like everybody else, but genetically, grandma, brother, dad. And I didn't even eat a lot of sugar then. So that's when you knew that, well, it's not like I'm eating candy all the time, guys. When I do eat, it's dark chocolate, uh, which is lighter in that, and it's a treat. So if mm -hmm. you're going to do sugar, do it in a thing called fruit. Uh, stay away from sugary beverages because that has zero nutritional content. That's just a waste of calories. There's no benefit of those calories. It's not like, hey, but I did a carb load. No, no, no. Carb load is complex <laughs> carbs. It's other type of carbs. Not, not I, I you know, took three tablespoons of sugar, put it in water, and drank it because that's pretty much what a Diet Coke, not a diet, a regular Coke is. Bunch of tablespoons in water and then some flavors. Yep. That's for sure. Um, yeah. And, uh, and sugar's, sugar's been a difficult one, but, uh, but I think I've, uh, I think I've got it tamed, you know, uh, down to the treat category of, uh, of things. Um, you know, so, uh, so not occasional, not, not more than occasional. Um, which is funny because because uh, I do things for my neighbors like making fudge. I, I've got a I've got a freezer full of little containers of fudge that uh, that I'm I'm going to be giving out to the uh, to the neighbors, <laughs> um, you know. But uh, um, but yeah, but I I don't eat very much of it. I, I I'll have like a little piece here yeah. and a little piece there and and all. But uh, um, but yeah. Um, you know, uh, yeah, eating eating the fats uh, and all. I'm not sure I could uh, I could do like Naresh and uh, and give up the uh, the tasty critters. Um, you know, because uh, uh, I, I like uh, I like meat, um, but uh, but even that, it's it's uh, it's becoming less and less. Yeah, no, I've I've yeah, I've had some of the new uh, some of the well, newer stuff, and I have a uh, yeah, taste. Um, yeah, it can be pretty tasty. Um, yeah, for sure. My yeah, my take my take's a little different. I don't think meat is bad. I think the overconsumption of beef is bad. I believe right. a balanced diet. And I found myself eating too much beef, which is higher in saturated fat, which leads to high blood pressure, which could lead to cholesterol, which mm -hmm. could lead to uh, you know cardiac uh, disease. Uh, so again, setting up my rules is. 
I don't do it as often, but when I do, I go all out and it's a filet. It's prime. Yeah. So instead of me eating meat multiple times a week, it's twice a month and it's a steak and it's me grilling it or going to Fleming's and having a good steak there. Um, mm. Pork, I know that some people have a religious kosher or, or halal, I think it is, but pork itself is actually leaner than beef and tastes good. So I believe in a balanced life of getting chicken, beef, turkey, pork, mm -hmm. eggs, um, but not going crazy. And the only thing that I think is suspect about these meat alternatives is the few times I did see it, I looked at the ingredients and it just seems that there's a lot of chemicals and I'm not mm -hmm. sure if it outweighs uh, the vegan lifestyle. I'm not an ex yeah. expert at this form of nutrition, but when I see an abundance of carrageenan and guar gum and all these other things and, you know, compare, I mean, first of all, hot dogs, forget about it. That ingredient list is huge. But now all of a sudden these meat alternatives also have very large labels. That would be a concern to me. Um, yeah. But I also understand lifestyle choices. There's people who swear by their vegan lifestyle. I'm not going to take anything away from it except one thing. And this is more for the athletes out there. Uh, the largest uh, marketer, if you will, of proteins in general is the whey protein, the dairy board. And mm -hmm. they were smart enough when all of a sudden pea protein, soy protein, all these plant-based proteins came out. Uh, they wanted to look at muscle synthesis, how your body actually produces muscle via proteins. And they created a lab verified methodology that it started off with University of Wisconsin. Go figure, cheeseheads, whey, protein. <laughs> so it started there, and there's now multiple universities who do that. And you can actually measure um, both in vivo and in vitro um, your uh, muscle synthesis that's activated by proteins. And there is a big difference between vegan proteins and with uh, whey proteins. Whey is by far the most efficient protein out there for muscle, more so than beef, more so than pork, more so than other things. Uh, but the people who are on a vegan diet, um, believe it or not, my product actually helps because it is vegan, but it gets you a better profile. And by the way, the difference between these proteins, not all protein is equal because they all have a unique thumbprint of amino acids. And there's some amino acids that are designed for muscle building. There's some amino acids which are more tissue repair and connective tissue and ligaments. Um, and again, the proteins found in most vegan plant source, I just call it plant source protein, is lacking in the valine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, the key ones that promote muscle development. So if anyone is watching this, and this goes for you, Naresh, um, my, my product is vegan, but because it's vegan, uh, we were able to manipulate the exact nine essential amino acids at a semi-essential and actually come up with a product that's designed to actually be better than what by like 11x. So hmm. we were on it. I wasn't going to get into too much pitches about my brand, but since protein came <laughs> up and I have a yeah. knowledge base. Um, and understand the labs who actually can measure muscle synthesis in the body or the Petri dish. That's the difference between in vivo and in vitro. I thought I'd at least bring it up. And uh, sure. uh, Bill, make sure both you and Narish send me your emails so I can uh, send you a, a free bottle. I'll send you a, a draft order. You put in your own address. Oh, wow. It'll be all free shipping to you. But uh, it is a game changer. So. Okay. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll definitely uh, definitely do that. Um, yeah, um, yeah. There's definitely uh, definitely a lot to be said for uh, for eating uh, eating right and eating well. Um, you know, uh, it, it's funny. I was just thinking uh, with uh, with everything we're talking about. There's uh, an old another old saying: If you're going to sin, sin well. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, it seems to go, uh, with it. If you're going to have that, uh, that steak, make it, uh, make it a prime cut, make it, uh, make it yeah. something good. Don't just, uh, just, don't just eat the cheap stuff. Um, 
you know, and uh, and I'm definitely going to uh, to work harder at uh, at doing that because uh, while I haven't had the the diabetes yet, I haven't even had the uh, scare yet. Um, I am uh, definitely overweight, and uh, and it's it's coming. It, it it looms on the horizon like a uh, like a dark cloud, and uh, um, so uh, so I'm definitely been working on uh, on that, but. Uh, um, but yeah, I will definitely send you uh, send you my email, um, Naresh. If it's uh, you want me to send uh, send Michael your email too. Oh, okay, great. Oh, oh yeah, I see that now. Yeah, I so rarely use the chat on uh, on here, but uh, <laughs> so let me write it down in case it goes. I just okay. copied it. So uh, so yeah, we've been uh, we've been going here for uh, um, for the. For about an hour now, we've been going pretty good. Um, and just as the uh, conversation gets good, it's time to uh, time to go and uh, leave them wanting more. So uh, I will definitely put your links in the uh, description um, so people can uh, easily find your uh, your companies. And uh, um, and hopefully there will be some business. Hopefully people have uh, gotten to know you in a little different bit of a way. Um, but, uh, before we do go, uh, I'd, uh, I'd like to ask, uh, um, if you find gentlemen have anything to say to the nice people, any last words, anybody can go first. Go ahead, Naresh. That was, uh, that was some, uh, final words. Uh, here's, here's uh, good, my... uh, go ahead. good little <clears throat> mini, uh, mini lesson there, mini class. Well, for me, um, this goes out to all the future entrepreneurs or existing, same with the CEOs, either future or existing. Uh, if you are successful, you'll find yourself eventually becoming an analyst because you're the one who put the money into it. It might keep you awake or worse, your wife awake. So along the line, when you're spending, you know, X amount of millions of dollars a year, you know, you tell your wife, I will be an analyst. Um, Every CEO I've talked to is pretty much the same way. But yet, strikingly, if you ask the question, CEOs can't answer numbers. So I believe that every CEO needs to know their numbers. The numbers for me are going to be different than Naresh, but define what your numbers are and what you need to know every day. So what do you need to know every day? every week, every quarter, every year. Yearly is easy because you have to line it up with corporate tax to personal tax, et cetera. But a CEO needs to know something every single day and you need to define what that is. For me, every day I get what I call my daily trend report and my CRO report. Naresh knows CRO conversion rate optimization. I'm sending so much traffic, but of that traffic, I actually care more about visitors, how many people added to cart, from cart to checkout, checkout to order. And within those, how many were new, how many were returning? Those are numbers I need to see every day. It comes in a report, it tallies it up for the month. But the big daily trend is very simple. I wanna know how much did I spend? How much did I make? How many transactions did that buy? And then I want it in the buckets of how well I did yesterday. How am I doing for the month to date? But then the buckets of 3, 7, 14, 30, and now a consultant says I need to have it for 60 because that's where cash flow comes in, especially if you're like me using credit cards to pay Facebook and Google and all those people. And by the way, I'm sitting on millions of miles. I don't, I don't pay for travel anymore. But nonetheless, <laughs> find out what those numbers are. And then just because you get data, that means nothing. It has to be actionable. How are you going to pivot? How are you going to direct? How are you going to lead? How are you going to have some tough conversations with your marketing team? How are you going to, you know, basically, you're the CEO. You need a vision. There's all the different levels of what it means to be a CEO. I'm not going into that. But what does a CEO need every day? What is that data point? And know your numbers. And don't say, well, I delegate. No, no. You don't have to populate these spreadsheets and dashboards. You just need to know. Um. Do I have them committed to memory? No, but I could click a button and tell you exactly how well I did in Facebook, Google's, how many transactions, how my Amazon business is doing, what my return on ad spend, average customer order value, 
cost of customer acquisition. I have that at my fingertips at any single time. And I'm amazed at how many CEOs, founders, entrepreneurs don't have that level of discipline. Because you can't make decisions unless you really are in the know. So that's that's my two cents. Wow. Got some uh, some heavy duty final words this week. <laughs> I may have <laughs> to make a clip. But uh, um, okay, well, thank you both uh, for being on the show. And uh, everyone, uh, be safe out there. Remember to wash your hands and stay tuned for the ending credits. Thank you all for tuning in. This has been a presentation of Bald Spots Productions. I'd like to thank our producer, my beloved mother, Eileen Hatch. I, of course, am your humble host. I'd also like to thank my special guests, Michael Maynard. And Resh Visa. Support the show if you feel so led over on Patreon.com. We're known as Bald Spots Pro. Don't you dare miss YWL Online. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube, and wherever fine podcasts are offered. Be sure to tune in next time when my special guests will be Kelda Music Diva, a music artist and entrepreneur who helps other musicians get started with achieving their goals. And Joseph M. Leonard, a great friend of the show and author of such wonderful books as Terror Strikes, Coming Soon to a City Near You, and How to Write a Book and Get It Published. He'll be talking about his upcoming book, among other things. Be sure to like, comment, and share. You know, subscribe, follow, whatever it is you've got to do to kick that algorithm into gear and help us reach more people. If you or someone you know need support now, call or text 988 or chat 988lifeline.org. That is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline here in the United States. 